two writers. One just starting out, the other a bestseller. Join James Blatch and Mark Dawson and their amazing guests as they discuss how you can make a living telling stories. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Yes, hello, welcome back to the Self-Publishing Formula podcast with James here and Mark over there. Um, I hope you are uh, had a good summer as we go into autumn. We are recording a bit of a batch, aren't we, over the summer, so um, we should be completely honest about that. This is not the 7th of September, the day before you're listening to this at the moment. Uh, this is just at the end of, uh, the beginning of, I guess, the vacation period to make sure we're covered. But we uh, we get into our really busy period in autumn, so it's good to um, to get these interviews going. We've had a really good summer of interviews. I've been listening back over some of the recordings that we've done. Uh, some of the author interviews, Orna was great. Uh, particularly enjoyed uh, learning about sleep from Anne Bartolucci. And this interview I'm excited about. Uh, this is uh, uh, an interview with an editor, actually the developmental editor I'm working with on my new novel uh, called Jenny Parrott, who's very patient with me because she doesn't get updates from me very often. Um, and she is fantastic uh, to talk to. I absolutely loved this. She's somebody who thinks a lot about how stories work. And you'll hear from the interview that she's not remotely snobbish about books. She's just completely enjoys uh, and understands that what we might, some people might sneer at the kind of uh, Da Vinci Code um, and I mentioned Robert Ludlum, uh, and she loves because she points out how difficult it is to write a book that's that's such a page turner. Uh, and so you can you may well sneer, but you can't really sneer at you know eight million dollars in the bank or whatever he walked away from with a uh, Da Vinci Code, perhaps more than that even. Much more than that. Much more than that. Yeah, and that was a book everyone had a copy of mm-hmm. at the time. And uh, I have to say I loved reading it, um, but also see the point that it's the way it's written is. It's not, you know, ever. There's no Booker Prize. No, but he didn't, he wasn't interested in no. in that. He wanted to write a, a book that people were unable to put down and mission accomplished. And the same can be said for um, E. L. James with Fifty Shades of Grey. No one is going to pretend that that is um, stylistically genius. Um, and I'm sure she wouldn't claim that for the book herself. But what she ca- she has done is written a book that has compelled hundreds and hundreds of thousands, millions of readers worldwide. Um, and there's a, there's a real skill to that. If, if, if it was as easy to do it, everyone would be doing it. Um, yeah. And I, um, I'm, I made a mistake right at the start of my career after I had a couple of traditionally published books. I decided that I would um, try and write a, 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 page, a page-turning thriller, kind of an airport thriller, based on um, this, after seeing the success of a writer called Matthew Riley, who was also published by Macmillan. And it was it was so difficult. It was the only time I've, I've struggled to um, open my laptop in the mornings to write. Never had that problem before. And at the end of the the process, I did finish the book, but it's absolutely dreadful, and it will never be published. I th- thankfully I haven't got it anymore. Um, but what I learned from that, and it took me maybe five more years to kind of fully understand that lesson, was that it's very difficult to to do that to write those those books that people find difficult to put down. And it is something that I've worked very hard on, and my my publishing company now is called Unputdownable. So that that is that's something that I aim um, very precisely to to achieve with every new book that I write. I'm I'm not trying to win the Booker Prize, because frankly, um, I'll probably make more money if I sell if I write and sell books that um, people will read quickly. They'll re- they're addictive. They'll read the next one. They'll recommend them to their friends. It's that's a much more um, sustainable business model for me, and also. And I find it very satisfying because it's, it's, um, there's certainly no shame in writing those kinds of books. Absolutely not. It takes us back in a little way to Chloe Esposito, who had a similar journey of, mm-hmm. um, of, of sort of Oxford and an A star student who went to Oxford University and had lofty ambitions of, of winning Pulitzer Prizes, etc. And in the end, has written. I think it's it's a youthful thing. I was yeah. 21, 22 when I, I thought that way, and um, experience tells you as you. Um, as you have mortgages to pay and and children to to you know to to bring up that it, you have to be practical uh, as pragmatism becomes a more relevant concern um, and those those loft, lofty ideals which are a bit naive that the, the only way to succeed as a writer is to have have someone garland you with with an award um, that's it's 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 not a very sensible way to approach things, and it's something that I think you learn uh, over time. Okay, well, your chance to pick up tips on how to write a page turner now, and uh, we're going to talk about some um, extra resources that we've created in in SPF for you at the end of the the interview. But well, let's uh, hear from Jenny now.
Jenny, thank you yes. very much indeed for joining us on the SPF podcast. It's great to uh, to speak to you. Great to speak to a you know somebody who spends their working life thinking about how stories work, why they work, and helping people make them work, uh, which is kind of what the rest of us spend our lives struggling to do. <laughs> well, I think most editors do too, yeah. as well. If they're completely honest. So, tell us a little bit about you and your background, uh, and what sort of day-to-day work you do with books. Well, I've got quite a mixed history. So, I'm an ex-journalist, but I've worked in publishing now for thirty years, and I've done publicity. I've done um, only a little publicity. I've done sort of bits of copywriting. I've done ghostwriting. I sold rights, I've done books to film, um, I have acquired, I also have two alter egos, so I write very commercial women's fiction. But day to day, the bulk of my work is either running my crime list at One World, which is an independent publisher, and One World's claim to fame is we've won the last two Man Booker Prizes. Wow. Um, I'm also a preliminary judge for the Costa Short Story Prize. I read um, and assess manuscripts for a literary scout called Lucy Abrahams. Um, So she's got 17 clients and a film and television company. And the aim of that sort of reading is to find projects before the other scouts do. Um, What else do I do? Oh, and I also do some work for Amazon, which is where I met uh, Mark Dawson. And I think, have you edited any of Mark's books? Yes. So I have done his Isabella Rose series for um, Amazon, which is on the Thomson Mercer imprint. Yeah, and I think that's the one that Hollywood are very interested in at the moment. So, um, oh, I can completely see why. Yeah, really cracking characters, um, absolutely sort of bone shattering pace. Yeah, they're, they're, they'd really translate well. And you've even had an early draft of my effort. Put in front of I you. I certainly have, yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, you'll be pleased to know that chapter one is now 33,000 words. And I think the whole of the book was 52,000 when I gave it to you. For it, the was, first. <laughs> it was, it was. Yes, said- I'm so glad that you took the plunge because you've got some great characters and a really nice setting. And I think you just needed the space to, yeah. to let them grow and come to life. Yeah, and I've I've really enjoyed so um, the notes I've had back from you, and even though some of them that like, you 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 specifically said one thing about because I've I've written as you know in in seven days with timings and sequences, yeah. it kind of runs, and I wanted it to be quite simple to understand for people this this narrative, but it lost some of the enjoyment of being there and getting to know the characters and caring about the characters, which is the key thing mm. that came across in your notes, and I think you said to me we well, did in, in in one of the sets of notes that. Um, I was perhaps assuming people would understand the politics of the peace campaigns and so on in the 60s and that I should do a background. And my, my initial thought was that that would break the the flow that I'd set up this these seven days, but I wrote it anyway, and I now love it. I love it as an introduction to the book. It's a nice little pause. Mm. I enjoyed writing it. I enjoy rereading it as a kind of, it all came off the top of my head, but I know quite a lot about the era. Um, yeah. and it sets it up nicely so um, I think my my initial feeling about working with an editor and it's a first brand new experience for me is always try what they've said before you dismiss it mm. um, because yeah I mean I'd agree with that I think no editor is going to say they've got all the answers but sometimes you can read something and you think this is what most readers are going to want to know and actually I think it will help all writers and I certainly do this myself if we ask ourselves continuously am I giving the reader what they need to have at this time not just what I want to say so in your case you're talking about um, a world a lot of people will know something about but there's a whole generation, a young generation, that might know nothing. Mm. And so you have to give them the framework that they can then fall in love with your characters or if not fall in love with them, become interested and, and want to stay on the journey that you're going to take them on. 
Yeah, I keep forgetting that I'm getting older and that um, not everyone we lived. All do. Yeah. We all do. <laughs> everyone lived through Green and Common and the peace yeah. camps and so on, which were huge news and sort of daily news when I was in my mm. 20s. But you're quite right. Um, my daughter probably has no idea. She's 13. I have no, no idea what CND no. is. No, I mean, it, that is distant history for. <laughs> All right. You know, a whole generation. And <laughs> I say this, you know, someone who all the time, you know, I work. Most um, people who are in the offices of publishing companies tend to be 35 or younger. And, you know, I'm old enough to be their mum. So it's, you know, I, I'm continually reminded of this. Yeah. But actually, I think it's a really good thing. To think to fit for all writers to think about are you know if you know nothing about a particular subject would you be interested enough to want to read the book anyway yeah that's, and, that's a good question you know, and i think you... actually you know it's that emotional connection so a book i use a lot now one of the things i do which i forgot to say when i was talking about me i teach creative writing for um, as an occasional tutor for Arvon and also for a company called Espirita. Um, and I think sometimes it's, um, you know, you've really got to sort of drill into your characters and, you know, you've really got to think about how you're creating your world. Yeah. And, and so often, I think, writers, until you have a certain level of experience, you think, what you want to say is the most important um, aspect. You know, where is your novel going? What is the overall message? But actually, increasingly, I think that readers read on an emotional level and all they're interested in really are the characters. Yeah, I know. I think, and of course, that must be right because uh, when you think about it, you know, you, you said, would people want to read a book about a subject they don't know? But I suppose most of us pick up books i mean well we will often pick up a book about a subject we don't know people go and watch indiana jones they don't know much about Absolutely. archaeology but what they care about so those common things that make the books you like why you like them those films you like why you like them it's the common things which is the character you want to be with the character who Absolutely, you enjoy seeing yes. and, and yeah, yeah so that helps focus that mind yeah it? there are two books that i use repeatedly and encourage um first-time writers to read, partly because um, they're so brilliant at taking um, the reader into a different world. And uh, the first one is The Fault of Fault in Our Stars, Fault of Our Stars. Anyway, it's John Green. And the fact it's YA and the fact it's a story about teenagers dying of cancer is irrelevant. It's a an absolute masterclass in, in pulling the reader into this world and um, instantly making the reader not be interested in the fact they've got cancer so much as in the dynamic of these teenagers. And the second book I really recommend people to read is, um, I think it's called Under the Skin, uh, or it might be Beneath the Skin, but it's Michel Faber, and that's a man, so it's M-I-C-H-E-L, and that's about a serial killer who happens to be an alien driving around Scotland doing body harvesting. But the fact that you're reading about an alien within 10 pages, it doesn't mean anything at all. You're just in a Shakespearean tragedy. Uh, yeah, great. Good, good recommendations. We'll make sure they're in our mm. show notes as well. We'll dig out the links for them. Um, yeah, I mean, gosh, I can start. I mean, Jonathan Livingston Seagull is a, a short but Completely. gripping yeah. tale, but it's a seagull. Mm. But it doesn't matter, yes. does it? No. I mean, well, look at Watership Down. And Watership Down, the terrifying... Yep. Yeah, I can never forget the terrifying film version of Watership Down, which still gets no, I, complaints every year. There's going to be another version on the BBC. Oh, is there? Um, so I think, yeah, so it's either going to be this Christmas, but more probably next Christmas. So uh, let's talk a little bit, because there's, there's people listening to this podcast, some of whom are very experienced and some of, of whom are just yes. starting out. So if we, if we start at the beginning end, you... I mean, I don't know what kind of range of books you normally edit, whether you edit first-time writers a lot oh, or I not. Oh, I do all sorts. Okay. So I've done um, Booker shortlisted authors down to people that are just writing a speech. Ah, so, okay. you know, I've worked a lot with first-time 
writers, um, you know, and some really well-known names. Um, but, you know, I, and I've had quite a lot of experience at working with self-published people. Yeah, yeah. So. Well, I guess that's probably going to grow for you. So mm. so for those of us who are starting out, I mean, there's, I, I hear what you say quite often when you say when you get more experience, this will become more natural to you. And actually that process of that becoming more natural to you, of working out what bits are important are going to make the book work, i.e. the character and stuff. It's it's quite difficult. And I am finding this bit difficult, mm. to, difficult. to make that mm. natural. Oh, yeah. I mean, who knew that writing a book was difficult, right? <laughs> Otherwise, yes. we'd all be doing That's it. Right. But uh, yeah. I don't know what advice you give people for uh, at my stage or in their first or second novels of of how to keep their focus on those things that are going to resonate with them, with the reader rather than get bogged down in the story that you want to tell because we all panic mm. about story most of the time and it turns out it's yes, probably the yes, least relevant that's part right. um well i think there's two things you can do first of all you can look through your book and look through it in a really cool analytical way and think does every scene have to be there is it in the right place i often use the words is it singing for its supper does it feel the right weight is it moving forward you know are you doing a silly information dump is it um you know just does it feel right are you happy with it and then go on to the next scene so that is a very good um guide because you will find that there are some scenes that you're less happy with because that's the nature of writing. Now one tip can be to do a printout of um, your novel and to read with two coloured post-it notes and just read from beginning to end, don't stop, and stick one colour on bits you like and one colour on bits you don't like and then when you finished your book you've got kind of like an emotional landscape of your happiness with your book because actually your happiness with it will probably replicate how the reader's going to read so i'm pretty certain the bits that you like that you think work other people will think work so being able to take that step back from your book. I mean, that's vital Absolutely. as well, isn't the it? The most important, the biggest thing I can say to self-published writers or writers who are trying to get a book that together and they want to get an agent is think of it as a whole and think of it as well that it's fluid. It can be any way you want. So you might try writing it one way. That's not how it necessarily has to be. So when I was at Bloomsbury... Um, probably 15 years ago a book was bought and it just didn't work and the editor she changed the sexes of the main characters and the book completely worked then <laughs> there's also a fantastic book by a writer called I think it's Catherine O'Fling um, called What Was Lost and that book was told in a dual time frame um, so you had modern day uh, or more modern narrative and interspersed with an older story it's about a missing child and the agent suggested to the author um, or at least this is what the agent told me had happened that the story be divided so that the story of the missing child is told which is roughly half the book and then the second half is the story of the man who works in the shopping center 10 or 15 years later as a completely different reading experience. So sometimes I think you've got to free yourself up. So often you, you have to write your book. You've got to get something down so you've got something to work with. But that is just one of the stages. So after that, you know, you could think about maybe changing tenses. So have some bits in past tense, some bits in present tense, or first or third person or different time frames, you know, or, or to, to bring some sections. If you've got a lot of information to get over, often, you know, you might as well put a newspaper article in there or a newspaper story or a letter because that can be a very effective way of just telling the reader what they need to know for the plot to make sense, to move on to the bit which is the character's working within that rather than shoehorning it into a slightly unrealistic conversation between two people absolutely because everybody does it i've done it yeah. myself and they do it on and film I'll and tv all the time 
yes and you know and it rarely works yeah. so you know sometimes you just think or otherwise put a historical note at the front of the book or you yeah. um a, 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 an author's note at the end of the book yeah yeah, it's you funny. Know, funny so. enough, I did have a newspaper article in the very early draft of my book, which I put in there, and I thought, took it out thinking it looked a bit amateurish to have that halfway between. But actually, maybe I should go back it's to it. It's kind of sometimes it's like the confidence in which you do it. There was so, there was obviously something wrong with it because you felt twitchy about it. So it may be that you hadn't quite got the voice right. You hadn't got the um, the you know there there would have been something right. Maybe it wasn't in the right place in the book. Yeah. So the other thing I would say is maybe think about moving things around. If you feel you're nervous about something, consider maybe putting the ending at the start of the book because you can always tell all your story, then have your ending in for the second time. But yeah. subtly different. Yeah. And that's because, what, of course, the reader knows much more. And that's quite a nice way of doing it, isn't it? I mean, all, all stories ultimately feel satis more satisfying when there is an arc. There's kind of a circle Absolutely, that almost meets yes. at the end and where things get yeah. wrapped. That's a way of doing that. So a co yeah. couple of uh, areas I want to talk to you about. One is that there's a, I think there is a tension here between the advice you get about driving the the you know the story along. Singing for its supper is a good good example yeah. of what you said there, and also allowing something to breathe so you get to know a character mm. and get to know mm. where you are and um you know describe the white picket fence and the birds chirping and the green grass and the yeah. going because you want this this scene of tranquility on the other hand i suppose yeah. i suppose you could argue that is serving its purpose because you want you need to establish yeah, that it, yeah it can be if you think of the you know um oh god there's david lynch film i can't think of it now but it's the one where the ear is found it literally is a picket fence blue velvet, um, is you it? know green grass and um, not blue course, velvet it might be blue velvet and but anyway it's all lovely and then the camera goes down and there's an ear in the grass <laughs> and that is a fantastic sort of narrative way i mean one thing i would advise writers to do is look at successful films a lot because mm. they will say a lot about structure and storytelling and um, viewer equals reader response um, so or otherwise what you can do is that you can think of okay I want to have this idyllic setting you don't have to to describe it all in one go no so you could yeah. Break use bits of description or that every time somebody is linked to say it is, is a house or um, a, a particular place you could have them described in very sunny language or warm language happy kind yeah. of memories you know th often it can be good to use different palettes of words for different people that can be a very very effective tool in that subconscious way that we read yeah. you need to do it subtly but yeah. um, you know that can work yeah that's interesting one of the films you told me to have a, another look at was The Right Stuff and um, oh, yeah. when I watched it uh, which is always a treat to watch that film again anyway um, I was amazed watching it from a story point of view of how, how much was missing from the story from the detail that I know about that era it didn't need yes. to be there it, it did become about the people and um, their sort mm. of tension with the situation they're in and much less about the kind of documentary narrative of, of what was going on then absolutely yes so it and, and of course it's mu the much better and more effective because of that one of the golden rules of writing is less is more because the more you hold back the more you save your armory of um, sort of dramatic tension um, uh, dramatic effects emotional resonance that you can bring in later on so you know the, the problem often with books that an editor's not worked on is that they feel to someone like me when I read they feel very one note so they kind of start at a canter and then they just stay at that canter whereas if you think of James Bond say that you're getting peaks and troughs so you're getting action relax action relax and that's how readers need to read yeah I, because it just doesn't work if no you're not 
kind of being taken at, at somebody else's rhythm. I think it must be why I hated Jack Kerouac's On the Road because it just went, never seemed to stop. That's it, <laughs> completely. <laughs> but some people you know, like So him. it's kind of very much of its time because yeah. it just is. It's, yeah, it's but, a stream, yeah. Um, mm. I want to talk about voice a little bit. And um, when I... When I first told Mark that I had this novel that I'd, I'd written, and he asked me what you know is it third, first person or third person, and genuinely hadn't even occurred mm. to me to make that choice or to really mm. be able to answer that question. I think people don't even think about this, but it is no. a choice that you make as to who's. Oh, and it's got huge implications both ways. First person can be incredibly engaging. Um, so if you think of something like Gone Girl. Um, whichever narrator you've got, the husband or the wife, you're thinking, no, you're the one who's telling the truth. You wouldn't get that with the person. Of course, in that book, they're both unreliable and it's a complete shaggy dog story. The problem with first person is that most writers get to a point of the book where they need to have something happening that the person who's narrating can't know because they're either not there or they're not going to be able to discover it without ruining <laughs> ruining dramatic tension. And that's where the problem lies, because first person is all about thoughts, what one person is doing. So third person gives you more of a panoramic um, canvas to work from, but you might not get that immediacy. Yeah. And I do think when I, when I'm writing my, which is third person, I often think, who does the re reader think this person is? Because mm. you know the stories do come from somewhere. And gen if you think, if you think mm. so someone told me a great story, the key part of that sentence is someone. There was someone there Absolutely. telling you the story. So mm. I don't want the reader thinking about me. I, and no author mm. particularly wants the person thinking about them telling the story. So I do wonder whether the first person. Well, it. it then it presents its own challenges in terms of restriction. It in really does. It's very limiting first person, actually. People often get the, write themselves into complete pickles yeah. because of having to stay there. And it's often an uneasy relationship if you do first and third in a book. Yeah. Sometimes, so that's why quite often people put in letters in books so you can have a first person view. Hmm. or a telephone conversation or something like that that you can have the I you know uh, perspective yeah but you often need just for logistical points of view so what I've found with my own writing is that I write in the third person that I I basically have one main character who will be in virtually every scene Right. And so, so you are getting a perspective. So the book's virtually written from what they can see and what's... Absolutely, yeah. and what they experience and what they think. Yeah. But it's... I think that's a good yeah. way of doing it. I think that's a good way of doing it because that mirrors life. You know, that's, that's our, how we walk through life as we see what we see, don't we? We know stuff's going to be apparent to us later, Absolutely, but we don't know it's happening yeah. now. So, okay. Yeah. Um, now, in terms of... Uh, um, sort of novel structure and length. I mean, are you, uh, are you happy to see sort of anything and, and anything works and some people will do a 45,000 oh. th word things, other people will be 400,000? I would... Well, if you're self-publishing, basically it's an elastic market. So you can go out with a book that is 20,000 words. Um, most print books that are sold in bookshops as novels will be, if it's literary, you might be able to go as low as 40,000 words or, or 60,000. But most books tend to be within that 80 to 120,000 words. Above 150,000 words, you're giving yourself real problems in that quite often people won't want to read longer books. And also, if you think there's a chance your book might get reviewed, a lot of book editors in magazines are paid by the page, so they write five or six reviews per month or whatever it is. And they literally will choose the shortest books from the books that have been 
sent to them because they don't get paid extra for reading longer books. Yeah. So that's human nature. So basically, you make yourself vulnerable. It's hard to make a very short book seem value for money, unless you're Ian McEwan and it's Chesil Beach and yeah. you know all the clever typesetting. But there is a limit on what you can can do to yeah. you know in a print version. Well, Ian McEwan. So I would say for most writers, try and think you don't want to be writing less than 70,000 words. Okay, that's good advice. Mm, I think It really is, because that, that sort of 80 to 110, 120, that's the sweet spot. That gives you enough time to um, develop and build a good story, but not to have people you know, completely losing interest. Um, the Every single book I've written for a publisher, has, um, they've tried to contract to 90,000 words. Right. So that's with both Hachette and HarperCollins. So, so just so people know, you know, that it seems an emotionally satisfying length for, for the trade and the reader. Yeah. Good. Well, you mentioned Ian McEwan. I think he's probably my favourite author, but I, I now realise that was, that's a bit of a handicap when you're trying to write because he's a, he's an amazing writer. And there's like mm. a lot of the brilliant writers who are right really up there. Um, there aren't really other people like him. He has his own style that he makes work, Absolutely. and I think to try and copy that would be foolish. So, and also if you read early Ian McEwan, they're quite different to later Ian McEwan. He's an interesting writer. He 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 evolves and he grows. Yes, yeah, definitely. With each book, and I think as writers, that's what we all should be trying to do. Even if we go into a genre, you know, I can absolutely attest that Mark Dawson works really, really hard at his physical writing. You know, he wants to be better with each book. And I think that's something for everyone to remember. The writers who tend not to do that as returning writers or having returning characters, their, their, their sales tend to stall and then decrease. Yeah. Because people don't necessarily need to have exactly the same hit again and again. Yeah. And it's, you see, it, another one that is, it, you can really see works hard at his writing is Ian Rankin. Yes. Yeah, I was going to mention Ian Rankin. And uh, another uh, Scottish Ian is um, Ian Banks. and Because I, I, oh, lo yeah. I love Ian M. Banks' science fiction. And he, mm. you can see him changing the way he writes and trying different things because they're all short stories and they sort of stand alone. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and he, yeah. I mean, he's, he's a great writer as well. So, um, yeah. But uh, yes, yeah, so that's the other thing. I, I was going to uh, move on to this about advice for for writers to improve themselves. And it seems like a good spot to ask the question. I mean, the simple thing that I found, um, and it's perhaps not as obvious as it should have been to me at the beginning, is to read more. And, oh, I was just going to say, with that, yeah. absolute, you know, shadow of doubt, the biggest thing you can do is read really widely. Read out of your genre, read things that you'd absolutely wouldn't think you'd be interested in read fiction non-fiction read the the uh, the newspapers you know absolutely really go for it i mean the and i'm not being facetious about saying read the newspapers because they will give you a sense of the zeitgeist of what people are interested in and it may well give you fantastic ideas but also you'll just be better informed yeah you know, and it sounds, you know, quite obvious to say that, but quite often people get an idea and they think, oh, I want to write psychological suspense and I'm going to have a character that's got OCD. And yet it's very obvious when you start reading what they've done, they know very little about it. Yeah. You uh, know, and I think, but, <coughs> but just having the the experience of, of reading how other writers have attempted things quite often you can think that doesn't work yeah and then you can think why doesn't it work why don't i like it and you can you can cross it off your list of maybe potential things you'd like to try yeah on the other hand sometimes you'll read things and think you know what that's brilliant yeah I, I know, you know uh, completely. In fact, funny if I've been surprised by reading um, things. In fact, I mentioned him because he's dead, and uh, I can't insult him. Is I picked up 
I'd never read a Robert Ludlum, but obviously it's mm. quite an influential writer for Mark and um, yeah. and uh, Lee Child and so on. Um, and I thought I just I just thought this writing is not for me. This right this this book has been written for somebody who doesn't really read a lot <laughs> they just read a very specific mm. type of thing and um actually kind of gave me a bit of heart because i spent a lot of time like most yeah. writers thinking my writing's awful no one's going to like it and then i read yeah. robert ludlum and i thought you know what if people like this they'll yeah. probably be able to read my stuff so um the yeah other, uh, one i often use is jeffrey archer and uh, yeah. you know people or dan brown yeah you know oh, they're really very very can... similar both of them yeah to what i yeah. experienced with robert ludlum yeah Exactly, you know, and yet the more I think about Dan Brown, the more I think of the four million cells in the mm -hmm, UK that mm -hmm. Da Vinci Code has had. And if you think about that, it's, it's really interesting because I think he completely understands the reader. And so he rewards the reader throughout the book by allowing the reader to think they're very clever and they're, they're in front of him you know, they're guessing what the story's going to be. Hmm. And actually, they're half the page ahead. Yeah. You know, isn't that, it, the books aren't quite as simple as they no. they seem necessarily. Well, as you say, the, the millions in the bank will te testify to that. And, and yeah. you mentioned... I mean, any books that are selling in their millions are, are worth looking at. And I would advise all writers to, to keep an eye on the sort of Rich and Judy list, you know, read prize winners as well, because you don't have to like them. You're not reading them to think, is this a fantastic book? You're, you're reading them to think, how, what is it about this book that has attracted this number of sales? Now, often it's because the market wanted that book at that time. You know, who knew that Fifty Shades of Grey hmm was going to, to work. You know, probably Girl on a Train became so phenomenally successful because it was published in the wake of Gone Girl and people who'd enjoyed Gone Girl wanted a similar feeling. So there's always that slight X factor, but most books that sell in phenomenal quantities have something very interesting in the way they're written. Yeah. Uh, yeah, without without doubt. Um, I mean, Jeffrey Archer, I think I have to thank Jeffrey Archer. For, I think probably the first grown-up novel I read was First Among Equals, one of his mm. early books. <laughs> um, and I enjoyed politics. And probably, as you say, mm. well, I, I can remember almost every page of that book. It was a, it yeah. was, You can turn every page mm. and uh, it's, a, yeah. it, it's actually probably very well written for all the snobbishness that surrounds it and, yeah. uh, and other jo Jeffrey Archer oh, books. I mean, I do think we've got to try and lose snobbishness yeah. in reading. So, you know, and I say that, you know, spending half my time working with very, very literary writers that, you know, often they're, they're as willing as anyone else to to read, you know, something that's Dan really, Brown, so yeah. yeah. So, you know, I think don't prejudge what books can can offer you. Sometimes it is those very commercial ones. Yeah. Well, a lot uh, of people listening to this want to be quitting the nine to five and working from home. So that's that's the top advice. Look what's selling. You mentioned the Rich and Judy book list, which is quite a UK specific thing. I, I guess I think it's the Oprah Winfrey. Um, I would be another one. Look and, at the New York Times bestseller lists. You know, just think it it doesn't really matter what. The books are it's it, what you're reading is those books that have got a resonance at that moment it doesn't mean you're gonna you know if you write a book just like that you're gonna get published but what it, it will do is, is give you a sense of what people are enjoying I mean and the, that often then helps you find your own voice yes and the um you mentioned you run uh you work for one of the imprints at the moment there, there's seems to be a crop of imprints around at the moment often within bigger publishing houses mm. whose sole job is to find the next gone girl girl on a train there and, certainly uh, are and um, i mean part of that is a commercial reason because publishing now is so polarized so um the most novels are only published between February and July because of publicity reasons. 
the big hitters, the Ian Rankings, Lee Childs, that, Kate Moss, you know, they're going to come out probably September, October time. Um, and, and you're Ian McEwan's bit because that's a good time for the man booker. Um, but so what that means is that there's actually a huge competition for identity in those in that six month period, and so you know various uh, big publishing houses start in print just so that the you can bring more to the market, and it also has the advantage that for certain prices, when you can only put two entries in. You can have more than one, yeah. <laughs> or, absolutely. Yeah, you yeah. know that it means that Penguin Random House might be able to put 20 entries in. Trick of the trade. Um, absolutely. Jenny, uh, before we, we wrap up, I just want to take a, a, a broader view of the role of an editor because I think, you know, occasionally you meet somebody, in fact, quite often, if they say, well, you know, you're self-publishing your novel, oh, don't you think you should get it edited? They'll say, I think, well, why do you think it's not being edited? You know, so self-publishing mm -hmm. authors pretty much understand that process, but just outline why your role as a developmental editor can be so important at the certainly at the beginning of a career. Um, I actually I think the development development I can't say it. Um, <laughs> developmental. Anyway, I think what I do, yes, <laughs> um, is the the issue is really providing a safe place for a writer to discuss options and to discuss what's working and what isn't. Now, often it's just that fresh pair of eyes having a look at, you know, what is in front of them. Now, what I would advise self-published people is to actually pay for an industry professional to work with you, partly because they're more experienced. Now, there's a big trend at the moment for beta readers and you know, and I feel very, very cautious because I think it's very easy to make good books worse. And people who are working in the trade, they know what is happening a year to two years ahead. So the reading I do for Lucy Abraham say, you know, and I'm not trying to push me, this is the same for anyone who, um, is actually working for a publishing house or is a, a proper freelance um, you know or the books I get sent to me at One World are for probably now 2019 and 2020 so you know 18 months to maybe two and a half years ahead um, so it, basically that's what you want because you want to know what's you know, if there's something that you're wasting time on. So I can remember a few years ago when the White Tiger won the Man Booker, there were all these stories in the press about, you know, the new dawn of Indian or Asian literature. But that wasn't taken into account that in the previous six months, there had been several six-figure deals done for Indian or Asian writers. And so basically that had completely killed the market for new writers coming along from a publisher's perspective because you know you can't get them into the bookstores and you're not going to get them reviewed because by the time you can bring them to market, everyone's going to say, oh, we're over right. Asia, we're over India now. And so, you know, basically you... You know, I mean, there are, you know, lots of different ways editors work. You know, they might provide lots and lots of notes or they might provide two good comments. It doesn't really matter. But what an editor's role is, is to get, your, get the writer thinking about their work and to be able to talk through any scenario of what the implications can be about certain choices. That's fantastic, Jenny. A great way to end it because I think... Um... The theme of this interview is getting writers thinking about their work and what works and what yeah. doesn't and uh, some, some great advice. So thank you so much. You've been uh, in incredibly eloquent. Every answer has been valuable, which is what we look for on the podcast. Oh, so. well, thank, thank you very much. <laughs> um, 
obviously checks in the post saying such nice things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the, well, the last thing I'd like to say is just remember that everybody wants good storytellers. You know, the film industry, the TV industry, the the people who go out and buy books, you know, or looking on Amazon. You know, we're greedy. It's there's always room for new good writers. But what self-published writers need to do is work harder a lot of the time than they are doing. You know, they often will, will think, oh, I've, I've written 10 great pages, or I can write. Mm. Whereas actually over 250 pages, it might not feel the same. So I think just realize you're in for the long haul and it might be hard work and it may feel a bit peculiar, but generally the people who've got talent and they work hard, they do tend to get rewarded. So, Jenny, um, yeah, you can see why I enjoyed that interview. Uh, she's brilliant to talk to. And I sort of felt afterwards that it could have been, I could have structured the interview better because she's got so much to say on every sort of individual area of story writing and narrative that we'll have a think about whether we do something with Jenny that might be a standalone little series on the different aspects of, of writing. I thought she did a very good interview indeed. Um, so, yeah, I hope people enjoyed that. Um, and we've got a couple of resources on editing. Uh, it is a bit of a mystery and it's something that's not intuitive when you first come into this area. I think people don't really fully even understand the role of an editor. And we've tried to address that um, with the help of some editors, haven't we, with a couple of books? We have. So um, Jenny is a developmental editor who first worked with me at Thomas and Mercer. And subsequent to that, I've introduced her to several authors that, that are in the community, including you um, and, and a few others as well. Um, I am copy edited by another Amazon editor called um, uh, Jennifer McIntyre, almost forgot, um, and um, Jenny is great and she's put together a book on editing for us, so explaining uh, the differences between um, proofreaders, copy editors, developmental editors, structural ed editors, all which can be quite confusing and quite expensive if you, if you get that wrong. So um, lots of detail on that. And also uh, best practice for working with an editor, things like sample contracts that you should be looking for and, and how to find a good one, how to uh, work on the relationship with your editor, which which is going to be very important as, as you progress as a writer. So you can get that book, which is completely free at selfpublishingformula.com forward slash editor. And then the second book is uh, found at selfpublishingformula.com forward slash maxims, M-A-X-I-M-S. And that was written by another editor called Elizabeth Bailey, um, who is a member of the community. And um, it is a book uh, from an editor's perspective, uh, five tips to write the kind of book that, that you know, we, we discussed with, with Chloe, and as we mentioned before, the interview with Jenny, uh, about how to write that kind of compelling page-turning fiction. Um, and uh, Elizabeth writes uh, really, really well, just as um, Jenny does and um, Jennifer. So, uh, again, a, a really good book to get you um, to upgrade your writing and, and learn some some f five actionable tips to improve improve the quality of your writing. And that um, is at um, uh, selfpublishingformula.com forward slash maxims. Yeah, and we should say that if you are a VIP gold, list, uh, gold subscriber, a gold listener to the podcast uh, via patreon.com, you get all these books sent to you straight away as soon as they're published so you don't have to sign up anywhere for them. So if you go to patreon.com forward slash SPF podcast if you want to help and support the podcast. And uh, at some point from where we're sitting now, it's not ready. By the time this interview goes out, it will be ready our new website I hope so. um, there'll yeah. be a single page on there somewhere so i won't give out the specific url but you'll find the books listed on our our brand new good looking website and uh, we'll talk about websites i think probably in the um in the not too distant future as well having just been through the process and you perhaps would have launched your new website by september yeah oh yeah the time this goes absolutely, out absolutely yeah yeah. yeah okay so let's uh let's let's visit websites as an important part of the process Great. Uh, thank you very much indeed to Jenny Parrott, who did a superb interview today and um, held her nerve with a couple of interruptions as a neighbour came in to drop off keys or something in the background, all of which got edited out but didn't throw her at all. Uh, thank you very much indeed for listening. Don't forget you can support the podcast at patreon.com forward slash SPF podcast. We'll be back next week with a man called Chris Fox, well known in the indie community. Chris is uh, um, the author of many helpful YouTube videos on exactly the subject we've talked about today. So a nice little two-parter with Jenny Parrott this week and Chris Fox next week on how to write and how to approach uh, story structure. 
So until then, have a good week writing and good week selling, and we'll speak to you next Friday. You've been listening to the Self-Publishing Formula podcast. Visit us at selfpublishingformula.com for more information, show notes, and links on today's topics. You can also sign up for our free video series on using Facebook ads to grow your mailing list. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time. We'll see you next time.